Hey everybody, welcome back to my shop. I'm Shannon Rogers, your host. And you know, woodworkers are pack rats. We hang on to every tiny little scrap of wood just knowing that there's gonna be that perfect project, that perfect time when this little piece of cherry is gonna come in handy. And you stick it in a corner, we've got elaborate racks and storage systems for storing the lumber. Heck, I've got a whole corner of my shop that's nothing but drawers and cupboards and shelves filled with offcuts of lumber. And you hang on to them, keep thinking it's gonna to come to, to fruition one day that that perfect project is gonna be saved by this little offcut. Three, four, five, ten years pass, and you still got this little offcut. I have scraps like this all over my shop. Heck, I work for a lumber yard. I bring home scraps from the dumpster, thinking that one of these days I'll use it for something. Here's a piece of sapili. You know what I used it for? I used it as a demonstration piece for cutting curves in the hand tool school. So you know what? It served its purpose. It's now been sitting in my uh, little scrap bins for over a year. So eventually, you're just going to have to let it go. You're going to have to get rid of some of these scraps. Well, scraps like this dug fur, then it'll go in the trash real easily. So you got to chop them up. So you, you might have a chop saw, you can break it up into little pieces, maybe you run it through a bandsaw, heck, maybe you even fire up your table saw. But you know what? This is an excellent opportunity to put our scraps to work and help us build and refine some of our hand tool skills. Hey, if nothing else, you burn a few calories along the way. Take a look at some of these scraps. They're long, they're thin, there's not much you can do with them. This is a great opportunity to practice cross-cutting. They're not real wide, so you're not gonna have to worry about tracking a line too long, but you can focus on keeping your cut plumb and keeping it square. So I'll come in here with a square, and I'll start marking some lines across the board. Doesn't matter the interval. In fact, that's a little too close. My intention here is to chop this up for scrap so I can throw it in the trash. So, you know, six inch intervals, I'll run a line down the board. Then I'll flip it up and I'll run a line along the ingrain in each one of these instances. And I want to utilize this as an operation, as an exercise to help me refine over a really quick, fast saw cut. This is not like you're having to, you know, break a sweat here. You're going to make probably four cuts here. And every time you make a cut, you can analyze how am I to my line? Am I square and am I plumb? And you can hit it with a square when you're done. Random pieces like this. There's no way I'm ever going to use this. In fact, this is a, a split on a board. This just needs to be chopped up. Well, how well do you saw a square line across an uneven surface? You can grab the one flat edge here and square a line down that. Square a line across and see how well you handle that. These pieces, this is quarter sawn white oak. This is probably what, a three inch wide piece? Yeah, three inches. I've got some decent length here. This I don't want to pitch, but I certainly don't need this end. So let's focus on sawing that off with precision and getting it perfectly square. In fact, if you want to take the hand sawing exercise one step further, take it over to the bench and square it with a block plane or test out a new shooting board by squaring this across the end. So put a bunch of layout lines on your boards. Grab a saw, get your saw bench, make yourself comfortable, and start making firewood. Finish that cut, hit it with the square, check in both dimensions, pat yourself on the back if you got it dead on, or if you didn't, analyze where you went wrong. Think about where your saw stroke altered so that maybe you ended up out of plumb or out of square. Assess that and make an attempt to correct it. Okay. 
One of the things that I find extremely helpful is exactly what I'm doing right now. Grab a camera, put it on you, film yourself. You'll be amazed what little hiccups and, and errors you see in your saw, saw stroke just by watching yourself saw. So I figure, let me make another cut here. And now, this useless piece of dug fur is ready to go in the fireplace, ready to go into the trash, but I've gained some valuable sawing exercise. For that matter, any muscle needs to be warmed up. So if you're coming into the shop for the day and you know you've got some sawing to do with a fair amount of precision, grab one of these offcuts. This is the perfect way to warm up your body and get yourself ready for precision sawing. You'd be surprised at how fast you can break down a bunch of stock just using a handsaw. You've burned some calories, you've elevated your heart rate, you've increased your skill set, and you finally cleaned up your shop. Don't forget about plywood. A lot of people say don't bother cutting plywood with a handsaw. There's some pros and cons of this. Ultimately, you're not going to get a very clean cut in plywood using a handsaw. But what am I going to do with this piece of 3 16 inch plywood? Well, it's, uh, it's about seven inches wide. So why not lay out some lines on here and practice sawing square on something that's just a little bit wider? You'll probably want to change up your saw to go with a finer pitched, preferably a, a panel saw that will handle a thinner material like this. But this is going to pose its own challenges in working with really thin stock. Plus, you're sawing square across a wider piece of stock. And you see how fast that goes. And now, this supposedly useless piece of plywood is not all that useless after all. Cross cutting is one thing, but a lot of people really get freaked out by ripping. It's a lot like work, but you know, with a fine tuned saw, it doesn't have to be that much work. You've got a piece like this, it's got a weird curve in it. Well, you know, there's not much I can do with this, but I can grab a panel gauge. I can mark a line on both sides of it. Grab a rip saw. On a thin board like this, there's a, a technique all, on a, all by itself in making sure, first of all, you don't saw into your leg, but then how to manage it as you come closer to the end. You can't really needle on it because you are going to cut into your leg. Finish your cut, look on the other side, and check your pencil lines. Hit it with a square and see how'd you do. Are you plumb to that line? And did you leave behind a relatively flat surface? Sure, it's going to be a little rough. A rip saw is going to leave a rougher surface. But if you really want to test your ripping skills, take this, clamp it in a vise, and hit it with a joiner plane. How many passes does it take to clean up that edge and make it ready for finish? There's your contest in and of itself. If it takes you eight passes with a medium set joiner plane, make it again. Try to get it down to the point where you can take two, three passes with the joiner plane and you're good to go. That's efficiency in sawing. The same thing applies with plywood when it comes to ripping. But, you know, there's nothing that says that all hand sawing has to be in a straight line. Clamp this piece of 3 8 inch plywood in a vise or in a bird's mouth fixture. Grab yourself a bow saw. Draw some squiggly lines on the board. Preferably something you can repeat on both sides. And 
go to work cutting some curves. This plywood thinner stock like this is excellent for working with a fine pitched bow saw or even a fret saw. Breaking down stock and rough cutting is where I tend to lose a lot of people. They think you're absolutely nuts. That's what I've got band saws and chop saws for. But how many of you own a back saw? How many of you cut precision joinery by hand using one of these back saws? How many of you have a bench hook? And how many of you have these little tiny scraps? This is not something you can cut or would you want to cut with a coarsely sharpened hand saw. This is the realm of the back saws. This may be junk, but it's outstanding practice material. Take thin pieces like this that are kind of similar in size, maybe different thicknesses, different lengths. Take four or five of them, lay it, put some layout lines on them and aim to get them all the same size. Get them the same length, the same width, and the same thickness. This not only takes your sawing skills, but it takes your planing skills and puts them to the test. Now this is gonna be certainly a little bit more involved exercise, it's gonna involve a few more tools. So since we're focusing on just sawing exercises, let's just focus on getting them all the same length. Come in here, grab yourself a square, strike a line across it, and focus on sticking to that line and sawing perfectly plumb. So much of the time, good sawing at a bench hook is all about stance. It's all about how you allow your arm to move back and forth without the body getting in the way and throwing that saw off alignment. Where I see, you know, thin stock like this, hey, that's, that's a piece of cake. There's not much real estate you're dealing with here to get that perfectly square and perfectly plumb. So what about something like this? We have a piece of Douglas fir here that actually came from building my joiner bench. Well, this sucker's two inches thick and it is three and a half inches wide. This is a slightly different beast when it comes to getting it perfectly square and perfectly plumb. You can scribe a line across the face and again, I'll scribe one across the edge. And now cutting this, gonna require a bigger saw certainly, but it's gonna require a lot more precision and it's gonna probably mean you're going to want to approach this a little differently. I like to tilt my saw down and essentially work my saw blade down the edge grain. Not necessarily all the way because obviously the toe is going to hit, run into my bench. I'm keeping a close eye on the line across the front here, but I want to continue to keep the saw tipped down. I've got a good curve established down the edge and that's going to really guide my saw and keep it plumb. It's on my line here, so I know that it's plumb. So now, keeping not with the saw not quite so tipped down, I'll lean back a little bit and work the west of the way, the west of the way, work the rest of the way across the line on the face. So now that I've got a perfectly square cut. So now we've got a good line squared down the edge, a good line squared across the front. You ought to be able to relax, let your body get out of the way of your arm, and finish sawing so you've got a nice square and plumb finished cut. Let's put our money where the mouth is. Oh, so beautiful. And she's nice and plumb. Probably not gonna happen on the first try if you've never done this before, but you very easily can start to diagnose where things are going wrong. A lot of people have good luck getting it square across the face, but go off plumb really, really easily. Another thing you can do here, go ahead and square your line across the face. Square your line on the edge again. But instead of just focusing, you know, trying to do both faces at once, focus on one at a time. Get the cut started here. And work shallowly, kind of tooth by tooth, back across the face. Until you've got a nice square cut. Now, come on up, flip it up on its edge. 
and work down the edge, tooth by tooth forward along the line. Till you've got a cut squared there. Now, relax, relax your grip, your grip, get your body out of the way, and let the saw do the cutting. The saw curves that we've established are going to give you all the guidance you need to get that perfect cut. If you manage, you still set those guide curves, if you will, in place, and you end up out of plumb, out of square, you're muscling the saw. You're not relaxing your grip, your body's somehow interfering with the natural motion of the saw, and you're forcing it out of alignment. Trust me, if you've got those guide curves and you get your body out of the way of the motion, it's just gonna follow those curves and you end up with a beautiful saw cut. There's been a lot of talk around the net lately about these old miter boxes, these meat powered miter boxes. These are a lot of fun. These are great, especially for small parts and mitering moldings and things like that. But I tell you what, the more you work with the bench hook, the more you build your skills in sawing to a line, the less you find yourself reaching for one of these. Now don't get me wrong, I love my miter box. I have this gorgeous bad axe miter box saw that Mark Harrell made for me. Works like a charm, cuts like a dream, and does it faster than anything. Specifically tuned to work in a miter box, you just can't beat it. But you know, there are a lot of times when in the heat of the moment, my miter box is over on the other side of the shop. I've got a board that I'm gonna need to cut at say a 45 degree angle. I know that I'm gonna end up shooting it anyway, so I grab a combo square, I strike a 45 degree line across it. I always pop up a bench dog because when I saw the motion's moving this way and the bench hook's gonna wanna slide on you. So you can either clamp it in a vise, clamp the cleat in a vise, or I just push it up against a bench dog. And now you wanna focus on the body positioning, the grip, everything to saw right to that line. So that your cut comes out square along the end grain and at 45 degrees. And you know what? A little bit of light under that, but that's pretty dang close. A couple of passes on the shooting board and this thing's gonna be ready to be a miter, whatever you need it to be. And you know, honestly, would it have taken me that long to walk to the other side of the shop or you know, move the miter box over? But sometimes that does seem like a pain in the butt. And I gotta tell you, this is a, you know, a, a finely tuned saw. It leaves a smooth surface that is you know, almost, almost joinery ready. Because I need to tune this a little bit, I'll take it over the shooting board first. Don't hesitate your ability to saw to the line. If you build your skills, you see the line, you can saw to it. For that matter, with some of these thick pieces, who says that the line has to be perfectly square? Who says the line has to be perfectly plumb? Why not draw in some wicked compound angles and saw to those? You'll notice that there's absolutely no difference in sawing a compound angle than to sawing a simple angle or even a square. Most of the time, it's just body positioning. Sometimes it's a matter of clamping in a device so that your body is positioned to cut it square. It's really up to you how you tackle that, but you don't want to jump into that the first time on a really important furniture project. Use your firewood scraps to test out those compound cuts and just get used to the motion of cutting compound cuts, cutting miter cuts, cutting square cuts. It's so much body muscle memory. After a couple of practice runs, you'll find this is easy stuff and I don't even need that miter box saw anymore. And you might find yourself not turning to the band saw or turning to the chop saw all that much anymore. And as I keep saying, you burn a few calories along the way and Lord knows I could use it. At the end of the day, Use your imagination. Let your scraps determine what kind of exercise you're gonna do. 
Thin boards could just be cross cutting. Thin boards could also be great planing exercises. Wider boards, well, that presents a different challenge with a bench hook. Maybe you want to focus on cutting dados. Teach yourself to cut dados on a, on a scrap board like this. Cut tenons on them. Heck, you could take these two boards. I've got some joinery on the ends here. Cross cut that off. Focus on squaring it up and dovetail these two boards together. Every scrap board in our shop, no matter how useless it seems, can have a use as practice, practice, and practice. Now that I've said all that, I've pretty much just refuted my original argument of it's time to clean up the shop and throw away the stuff we're never gonna use. Now you're thinking, hey, I'm never gonna use that, but it's gonna be great practice material, so I'm gonna keep it anyway. So to all the spouses out there that have urged you to clean up your shop, I'm sorry, I just gave woodworkers out there another reason to hang on to their scraps. Thanks for coming by, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Perfectly square, in perfect harmony, like Mao Edge. <laughs>